Ibrahim, Assalatu Salam Alash of Mussolin, Alhamdulillah, Wahta Wabahin Astain, Salam Alaikum, Ramatullah, Barakatu, Ramabad. I have lectured in major Islamic conferences for half a century. It's the very first time I've ever been invited to speak about philosophy. And I'm very pleased that this event has taken place because it implies an opening into a very critical and important aspect of Islamic intellectual life, which has for too long been neglected by the more popular movements of thought within the Islamic world during the past few decades. I did not choose the subject of this talk myself, but it was chosen for me, and I'm glad of spending a lifetime in the study of both Islamic philosophy and philosophy globally to try to summarize for a minute, in a few minutes for you the vast subject of why philosophy matters, why it is important for us as Muslims and for humanity at large. First of all, some definitions. There is a kind of fright that exists against many modern Muslim reformers and thinkers, going back to Muhammad Abdo, about the very term philosophy. Although the founder of this movement, Jamal Din Afghani, studied Islamic philosophy for many years in Tehran before fleeing uh, before the onslaught of the government at the time from the country, first to Afghanistan and then to uh, Turkey and Egypt. The term philosophy has remained somewhat vague for us, uh, precisely because it covers such a vast field. But its vagueness in Islamic context and the Western context are very, very different. In the West, philosophy has a vast array of meanings, a whole spectrum of meanings. People as different as Plato and Derrida are called philosophers. And there's not a single universal worldview or even several worldviews which you might say the major philosophers share. Uh, most of philosophy in the West has become something other than what philosophy was understood to be for millennia and during the Greek and Roman period, the periods of the thought which Islam and the West shared together in many ways. In modern times, much of philosophy turned against Sophia. It's not uh, unimportant to mention that some wise men have now called Western philosophy misosophy, that is hatred of wisdom rather than love of wisdom, but philosophy originally meant love of wisdom. As for Islam, in the Islamic context, many people forgot that the Quran itself twice mentions the word hikmah, uh, which uh, it mentions as being a great gift from Allah Ta'ala, yuti khayran kathira. Uh, when God gives hikmah to someone, and that this word hikmah was understood to be the same thing as the Arabized uh, word falsafa, which came from the Greek philosophia. But in Islam, we had a, a very different situation developed. Uh, we had a particular school that was called falsafa, or set of schools, and then we had other intellectual schools, such as theology, kalam, usul, and others, which, in fact, although not called technically philosophy, were very philosophical in nature in many ways. If Ash'ari, the founder of the Ash'arite School of Theology, which is a prevalent school of theology in Sunni Islam for the last thousand years, attacked falsafa, at the same time he spoke about reason, he spoke about causality, even if he denied it, he spoke about issues which are properly speaking philosophical. And the discussion between Iman and Aql, or faith and reason, which itself is a philosophical issue, was of central concern to all kinds of Islamic thinkers, even those who are not called philosophers. You might say that philosophy is like politics. You can have good politics or bad politics, but in no society they can have no politics. In the same way with philosophy, everyone whether he or she is aware or not, has some kind of philosophical view of life, of action, 
of ethics, of thinking, of what is good, what is bad, what is true, what is false, what is beautiful, what is ugly, and so forth and so on. And so it is really impossible uh, without doing with philosophy. And one of the greatest tragedies which the Islamic intelligentsia has faced during the last two centuries, since the beginning of the onslaught of Western thought after the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt, let's say around 1798, 1800, against the Islamic world, is the refusal by many parts of the Muslim intelligentsia, not all, to revive and come to, come to terms with its own major philosophical and intellectual tradition. That is, we have a kind of anti-philosophical vein in many Islamic movements, which nevertheless are faced with a challenge that is primarily philosophical. The challenge of the West to the Islamic world is not like that of the Mongol invasion. The Mongols invaded the Islamic world with a million horses, a million horses. That was enough to destroy whole lands and killed many people. But they did not challenge Islam intellectually. That was not the challenge. The challenge was the bows and arrows and the horses of the hordes of Chinggis Khan's grandson, Holaku. Whereas the main challenge of the West to the Islamic world is not only the tragedy of the drones that kill innocent children every night in Afghanistan and Pakistan for whom no one cries. Uh, unfortunately, since I live in Washington, I cannot just take this anymore. When if a blue-eyed child dies in Connecticut, everybody cries. I'm uh, very sad for that, of course. But when a dark-eyed child dies somewhere in, near Peshawar, nobody even cares. Uh, it's not, but it's, the challenge is not this. It's not only drones. It is not uh, economic pressure of IMF. It is not stooges placed upon governmental uh, uh, authority in different lands by Western powers. The greatest challenge of the West to Islam is intellectual. It's predominantly intellectual. It has to do with the realm of thought. The fact that we have lost our sense of confidence has a great deal to do with the fact that we have stopped as a civilization to think enough and to think correctly. A civilization which produced some of the greatest thinkers in world history, no matter what criterion you use for greatness. And this is very sad because in a lot of Islamic revival movements, because in Islam, alhamdulillah, the faith is still strong, many of the reformers have uh, not paid enough attention to the importance of thinking, of correct thinking, of what would be probably philosophical in the Islamic sense, of the 1100-year tradition of hikmah, falsafa, which stretches from the early Abbasid period right to our own day. They forget the verse of the Quran, which says, we revealed the Quran so that people will intellect, will use their intellect. That is the cause, the reason for the revelation of the Quran, this verse says, is that so we can intellect. You see, I don't use the word reason. I'm trying to revive the old English usage of intellect in a verbal form, which has been lost now. That is to intellect, because in Arabic it's used in both as a verb as, as a noun. Intellect is not only reason. It is more profound than that. The great tragedy of the West is the death of intellect and is being absorbed into reason. And therefore, the cutting of the nexus, the line, the link between reason and revelation, between religion and science, between this world and the next and everything else, which never existed in classical Islamic civilization because ya'qalun, aql, was not simply rational discourse. It was a substance which allowed us to know in a primordial and essential way. And we are heirs of this civilization and the Quran that we keep reciting without yaqalun, without people thinking, without using our aql, without naqalu, without our being able to think clearly, think well. Can you imagine how absurd it is? A civilization that has created a place like the Taj Mahal, which is pure geometry or the Isfahan Mosque, or the Fez uh, courtyard of the uh, uh, Madrasa and Fez, that is based on clarity, pure geometry, mathematics of the most rigorous kind, 
Should not be so wishy-washy in his thinking, so weak in his response to Western thought, to the major challenges of the West, to the extent that we have so few voices which will even be accepted to be heard globally when it comes to intellectual matters. Yes, we have very good physicians, we have very good engineers, we have this and that, but when it comes to the primary questions which have to do with thought, with the future of humanity as is related to the intellectual aspects of human life, where are the Muslim voices that are even taken to be serious, taken seriously on a global uh, level? That is our own fault, especially being heirs to civilization which always emphasized on the basis of the Quran the significance of clear thinking, of using our head, as one would say in colloquial English. Now, when we look at uh, the situation today, uh, there are all kinds of isms which come from the Western world, like waves of the sea upon the shore, one after another. We have all of these terms, which all of you know, some of you might not, rationalism, empiricism, humanism, evolutionism, and then the more political and social aspect of things, liberalism, socialism, nationalism, then intellectual aspect like scientism. All of these isms are swimming around and they are in incorporating, in fact, our mind in many ways. The educational system in the Islamic world is such that is in most countries, not all, Iran and one or two countries being an exception, but checked out all the Western schools. Most of them are dominated by the colonial period through missionary schools. 90% of the most richest children in Egypt or Pakistan go to Western schools. They, they, they do not go to Muslim schools. And the old madrasas are only for the poor people. It's not like two, two centuries ago. And it's these people who run these countries and the minds are totally brainwashed with these isms. And even if you are pious and we say our prayers in, at Fajr and the Maghreb and we pray, the rest of our being is immersed in these Western isms. And Islam has failed to provide fully a response to all of these isms, which like the wind coming from the East comes, comes coming seasonally and every once in a while with a new ism. We have to wait to see what new ism comes, and some of us swallow it, some of us don't pay attention, but it, it affects people in many, many ways. I remember I was in Tehran when the famous French philosopher Foucault came to Tehran. And nobody had heard of Foucault very much at that time in the West. And we had an evening together. He was a very intelligent person, but unfortunately had no iman, no faith. But he was a person you could talk to. And we spoke about what he was saying he said, nobody in France is listening to me, but they will. And we, I invited a number of young Persian uh, students and professors and to have a discourse with them. And he was saying, you know, as soon as my ideas catch in France, you're, you're going to be popular here. That's exactly what happened. Then Foucault died, and then Derrida came. He, di he died, somebody else comes, and so forth and so on. We are at the receiving end of waves, some of which are more social and popular, like nationalism and socialism, some of which are more intellectual, but we are a passive civilization vis-a-vis -vis all the isms that invade us. Now, all these isms have to do with philosophy, way of thinking, with a world view. Rationalism itself, which is the basis of modern civilization. Now you have post-rationalism, and in the postmodernism, but until the early 20th century, was the foundation of Western thought. That itself is a philosophy. It is to say that reason is the only way to reach the truth. And how many Muslims do you know who are pious during hours of prayer, but the rest of the day they're rationalists? And they're confused thanks to a lot of modernized Muslim writers who don't know their left hand from right hand when it comes to Western thought. They've made a confusion between aql as intellect and reason, or istidlal in Arabic, as the rational faculty we use in everyday life. And have you made this confusion? They say, oh, Islam is rational. And sometimes we have the extreme meeting of these two, which results in this kind of wedding 
between extreme fundamentalism and extreme worship of technology, which you find in certain parts of the Islamic world today, where on the one hand you use the, la the latest technological means, you really worship technology, you say Allah, 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 but the, your actual Allah is modern technology. At the same time, you're fundamentalist defending the rights of Islam without any content. But the great tragedies that are facing the Islamic world today, the fact that we cannot answer questions because of this lack of thinking. Not all questions can be answered with the fist. If you have a fire, I always tell my students in a forest, you cannot play the violin to it. You can play a good violin to overcome bad violin playing. But you need water, to same substance, to overcome the fire. Now, wrong thought needs correct thought. Wrong thought cannot be cured by shouting, by indignation. That's not enough. Emotions do not answer wrong thinking. Only right thinking does. And the Quran is the guide to this over and over again, and always distinguish between those who are able to use the intellect correctly and who do not. Are those who know and those who do not know equal? And the Quran says, no, they're not. Those who use their intellect are those who are really good Muslims. And this is a lesson really forgotten for us today. And I, as a humble educator, I spent 50 years on this issue. I'm very sad that uh, our progress in this matter has been so slow. We even, I was one of the four people who established Islamic university systems by, by arranging the first conference in Mecca in 1977, the World Educational Conference, with Dr. Zobair and uh, uh, Dr. Nasif and one other person, uh, uh, Dr. Ashraf, who died, a Bengali scholar. And we decided to create these Islamic universities, people invited from all over the world for that, uh, presidents of universities and ministers of higher education and so forth, and these were established. In all of these universities, we failed because it has one kulia sharia, which teaches Islamic subjects, the others are all Western subjects. They're all Western subjects. And we have not used our mind as Muslims to think these through Islamically. I'm not saying this is easy. It's a very, very difficult task, but it's not an impossible task. But the future of Islamic civilization as a distinct civilization is based and relies upon the degree of success we have in being able to think both Islamically and clearly. Now, in order to do that, we first of all have to revive our intellectual tradition. The intellectual tradition, every one of which, or aspect of which, branch of which is a philosophical aspect, includes, first of all, usul. Usul al fiqh and usul al din both have a philosophical aspect to them, very important philosophical aspect. Even the science of semantics, which is a branch of modern Western philosophy, is discussed in Alm al Usul for other reasons. These are technical matters in an audience of 20,000 people. I cannot go into these things. But let me just tell you that even Usul, which is a purely religious science, taught in Al Azhar, other religious universities, the philosophical aspect to it, which needs to be revived. Kalam, Islamic theology, which has been under attack by modernists since the 19th century, but which is still survives, and you have also neo mutazalism in Egypt and neo uh, uh, Asharism. The Salafi movement is, of course, against all of this. It's against the whole Islamic intellectual tradition. But the serious Muslims who understand their tradition, they understand the significance of Kalam, both Sunni and Shiite. That has to be revived for our own day, but also having awareness of its philosophical base. And then what we call metaphysics, gnosis, ma'rafa, irfan, the science, ultimate science of the real, which is Islamic metaphysics, which was the heart, really, of the intellectual science of Islam. That needs also to be revived and made present for us. And even it's the sciences, the Islamic sciences, and, of course, the Islamic philosophical tradition. Now, if we were to revive this whole intellectual tradition, it would provide the framework for us within which we could then think and confront issues coming from modern disciplines which need an Islamic response, an Islamic awareness, and Islamic way of integrating it 
into the living body of Islamic civilization. Let me give you two examples. Example of science and example of the humanities or the human sciences. For 30, 40 years now, we've been speaking about Islam and science. It was in 1964, when I was in my 20s, I'd, I'd written this book, Science, Civilization, and Islam. This debate began about the question of Islamic science. I used the term Islamic science on purpose, both to overcome the Arab nationalistic view of calling Islamic science Arabic science, which is historically false. Uh, Islamic science were not only cultivated by the Arabs, most of it was cultivated by the Persians, and a good part of it by the Arabs, and a little bit by the Turks and, and Muslim Indians. Uh, but the greatest scientists like Ibn Sina, Biruni, all of, none of these people were Arabs. So, and also it was Islamic in a more profound sense of being related to the principle of the Islamic revelation. That caused a great deal of consternation. At that time, a lot of debate, other schools of thought came up, the Ijmalis for a while, and a, a lot of scientists in the Islamic world rejected my idea that religion, or Islam was related to science. They said science is science, and it's absolutely absurd. Science is not science. Science is based on a worldview. It's based on a paradigm. Any philosopher of science at Oxford University who's an atheist will tell you that. And for us Muslims, science has to be based on the Islamic paradigm. And so I've been in this battlefield for 50 years. I've been a very severe critic of scientism. I believe one of the greatest diseases of the Islamic world, much worse than the malaria that is attacking East Africa, is scientism. Scientism from which governments as different as Saudi Arabia and the Islamic Republic of Iran, as Malaysia and Egypt all suffer from, all governments support science without knowledge of what it is. They want power, power and wealth, that's understandable. But the intellectuals who support it believe that through science comes power, and therefore this is Islamic. And God says you should pursue ilm, and science is ilm, and therefore science is Islamic. Whereas a science in which the existence or non-existence of God is irrelevant, in which you can be a physicist and be a good Catholic, and you can be an atheist and be a good physicist and win the Nobel Prize. Such a science cannot have any place in Islamic civilization. Very few people have the courage to say this. But I'm not at the end of my life. When I was 25 years old, I said that, and I still say it. We need to understand that scientism is not possible to accept. Most of Muslim intellectuals really worship science and technology. They say they worship God. Yes, a few hours a day. The rest of the day, we worship science and technology. And this is the great malady of the modern world. The environmental crisis one day is really going to take good care of us, and people will stop this worship that now is all over the world. It's not only in the Islamic world. It's in Hindu India, look what's happening to India. The land of Shankara, what, what is happening to it now, and it's, of course, in communist China, where from the time of Mao Zedong on, of course, Western science was really the god and the Chinese have put that in front, but they consider it to be communist and atheist, and they don't have ideological differences with it as we do. Uh, and we should be very, very careful about the scientism. Now, the scientism can only be confronted by the revival of thinking, the Islamic philosophical tradition, because the response to scientism is philosophical. If scientism itself is not science, it's a philosophy. It's a philosophy about the nature of things. Philosophy of nature, philosophy of knowledge, upon which it's based, is the negation of all forms of knowing nature except through modern science. And therefore, it's a particular philosophy of both knowledge and of nature. And the response to it can only be philosophical. We cannot confront the danger of scientism without uh, philosophy, without correct philosophy drawn from our own philosophical tradition. As for the humanities, there's been a talk for some time about Islamizing the humanities. I was for many years the dean of the most important school of humanities in Iran, the, of the Faculty of Letters at Tehran University. And I was at the forefront of the movement to try to at least, if we cannot do it with physics, let's make our disciplines of the humanities Islamic. Let's not study history from the point of view of France and have a little Islamic chapter in between. Let's not study literature from the point of view of English and then have a little chapter on Urdu literature at the end. If you look at the 
curriculum of the University of the Islamic World. It's an absolute disgrace. Absolute disgrace. What civilization has ever come to study itself from the point of somebody else? Look at the majority of history books. Right now, being taught in Islamic universities, they're all based on the Western view of global history. And I could go down the list in anthropology, language, and so forth and so on. And there's a movement now for the Iran. In fact, there was a fatwa given by the Supreme Leader of Iran for the universities to try to work on this. But they're barking up the wrong tree, more or less, unfortunately. I'm now planning to write an essay on this subject and publish it in Tehran. I'll do it soon, because I've been at the forefront of this. But how can a civilization survive? when our children put aside physics and chemistry, they do not have an independent view of their own literature, of their own art, of their own thought, of their own social structures, of their own view of the universe, from the point of view of their own civilization. How can such civilization survive? We, this is a very major crisis. And this, again, is a philosophical issue. It is, it is educational, but it has to do with philosophy not only education and philosophy of how to teach the children, but what content should be used. Alhamdulillah, not everything is so dark. There are lights on the horizon. There are people now who gradually realize this. And there's a very important battle that has to be carried on. But even if there were one person shouting in the wilderness about these things, it would be worthwhile doing it. Because the truth ultimately always triumphs. And I hope and pray for better days when especially our younger generation, some of whom are here now, will begin to pay more attention to philosophical, intellectual matters. And for parents, all of those wonderful mothers and fathers who are sitting here. I'm a professor. I've had many, many students from Muslim families who, after coming to one or two of my lectures, decided to shift from engineering or medicine to Islamic studies or to study philosophy with me. And the parents fainted, the father had a heart attack, the mother but fainted in the kitchen. Uh, think of God, think of Islam, you who love Islam. Sacrifice something yourself. And that sacrifice is self-aggrandizement of the parents that my, that my son is a doctor, engineer. Of course we need doctors and engineers, but we also need Muslims to devote their life to these issues. They might make less money than a good surgeon, but the community needs it. And I said always, And it's a to uh, general sacrifice. It's the fard kafaya. It's not fard, fard ayn. It's fard kafaya according to Islam. You know, that is incumbent upon the community as a whole. Maybe not upon Hassan or Taghi, who are especially gifted in mathematics, some will become engineers, but uh, the, the community as a whole, especially the Islamic community living in Europe and America, to be able to do what the Jewish community did in 50 years in America taking over every single seat of Islamic of Jewish studies in America, except one that is not occupied by Jewish scholars. Our hats off to them. I was just saying that at lunch to some friends. When I was a student at Harvard University, there was only one university in America whose professor of Jewish study was Jewish at Yale. Everybody else was a Christian who knew Hebrew, Old Testament scholar. Now, every university, as of Seton Hall, is a Catholic University of Northern New Jersey. Every university, the professor of Jewish studies is Jewish. I hope, inshallah, when I have died and you come and lecture in a few decades, somebody will be able to make this statement for the Islamic world, for the Islamic community. And that will depend more than anything else on our reviving our intellectual tradition, combined with faith and iman. These are the two great legs that lead us to paradise and it makes us a successful community on earth. Faith in Allah Ta'ala and the use of the greatest gift that He has given us, that is Allah. Alhamdulillah.